and welcome back to my channel. Unless you're new here, and then it's just welcome. My name is Rusty, and this is my channel where I talk about my favorite movies, mostly horror, and my favorite music, mostly metal. And um, I'm very, very excited to be able to do this movie. Um, I've waited a long time. I looked for it. I kept hoping that someone would re-release it. Um, it's expensive and I'm cheap. I like quantity over quality. No, that's not true. I like quality. All of my shit's quality or I wouldn't buy it. But I do like getting a bang for my buck. But I finally gave up. I bought this movie. Had to pay like 30 bucks for it brand new to get it into my collection. But sometimes we have to do that. Now this might be a little longer than usual because there's some other stuff I want to talk about leading up to the movie. And that is... If you've ever been around my channel, this is the most, in my entire life, this film is the most exciting, most wonderful, most memorable um, theater experience that I've ever had in my life, is this movie. And I will tell you why and about that, and help you get why this movie has such a intense emotional connection to me is very important to me and is a huge part of my cinema life um, and my love of film is this little independent little movie okay number one if you've ever been around my channel you've probably heard about the Friday the 13th incident now I was a very sheltered child happily so um, I was not allowed to watch movies or anything like that, uh, rated R movies, adult movies, horror movies, anything like that. Very, very sheltered. And um, I'm actually glad of that, and I'll explain that a little bit too. Um, so prior to seeing this at the theater um, and the Friday the 13th incident, prior to the Friday the 13th incident, I had been to the movies. My dad had took me to see Midway and Tora 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 at the drive-in. Um, <clears throat> I was dropped off quite frequently as a child for kids' movies at the theater. Um, just dropped off under the care of the owner, Mr. Sapp was his name, him and his wife. She was also the school teacher. She was my, uh, a middle school school teacher. Um, so she later became my teacher when I got to middle school, but I had seen, I had been dropped off for a Star Wars revival, so I saw the first three Star Wars movies. I had been dropped off for a Planet of the Apes revival, the first three Planet of the Apes movies, stuff like that, Bambi, All Dogs Go to Heaven, you know, stuff like that. Now, when I was 14 and a half, um, the Friday the 13th incident occurred. Now, the reason that I am glad of that is, first I'm going to explain that part. I hear a lot of people talking about, you know, their first horror movie experience and stuff like that, and I'm often flabbergasted by people going, oh, I was eight years old and I watched, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street with my uncle, or, you know, I sat with my mom and watched, um, you know, I spit on your grave when I was eight, you know, and stuff like that. And I'm always like, what? Why? I, I don't know. You know, man, I'm, I'm kind of glad nothing like that happened to me. And here's why. If I had seen Friday the 13th, stop and think for a minute. If I had seen Friday the 13th and Friday the 13th part two when I was eight, I wouldn't have identified with it. It would have been a bunch of grown-ups having doing grown-up things, having grown-up things happen to them. I would have been really disconnected from it. If it did scare me or something like that, it wouldn't have had the same effect. So I'm very glad that I didn't see horror movies when I was like a little child because of this. The Friday the thir 13th incident, as I call it, my dad took me and my BF at the time to a Friday the 13th revival at the local drive-in, which was about five miles outside of town. 
He had absolutely no fucking idea what he was doing. He did not know what it was. I don't know why he did that. I don't know what he was thinking it was, but it was not what it was. <laughs> Within 30 minutes of uh, Friday the 13th starting, I, of course, had found heaven. Um, but my dad had, within 30 minutes of that movie starting, he had thrown popcorn all over the car, he had spilled a drink on himself, he had screamed out loud, and he was like, we are not watching any more of this shit, I'm leaving, we're leaving. We used some really nice psychology, and that is that I started calling him a Frady cat. I was like, oh, my dad is scared, you know, that's why I was telling my BF, you know, I'm like, my daddy's scared, you know. Well, there is no man going to be called a chicken shit by his 14 and a half year old son. So we got to stay. He, of course, had to go to the concession stand a little too much and didn't come back with stuff. I think he went and got drunk, to be honest, because that's the only way he could handle it. The damn movie was giving him a panic attack. But we got to see Friday the 13th, part one and two, and that was it for me. I was in love with horror. I was 14 and a half. So these were my people. I could identify with them. I could crush on who I wanted to crush on. I already had those feelings. So instead of seeing um, a bunch of adults doing adult things, I saw high school kids. I, I identified with, with them, and I think that made the movie so much better. If I wanted to crush on Kevin Bacon, I could crush on Kevin Bacon. I knew what a crush was, and I could feel it. So the movie and its content was not so alien to me like I think it would have been when I was eight. So I'm very glad that I was sheltered. I'm very glad that I never saw a horror movie until I was 14 and a half. Of course, then, you know, it's like Moses parting the Red Sea. The gates were open, and I was off and running, you know. So another interesting fact about the Friday the 13th incident is after it was all over, my dad never said anything to me about movies anymore. I was allowed to go see whatever I wanted to from that moment on. Looking back on it, I think it was probably because it didn't scare my son. My son called me a chicken shit, actually. Um, it didn't cause him to have nightmares, it didn't do him any harm, and it didn't turn him into a serial killer or change his behavior, and he's still doing great in school, so it must be okay. So my dad never forbid me, forbade me, um, or stopped me from going and seeing any movies. Now, for the next year and a half, you can imagine, I was completely hog wild. You know, I mean, every weekend I was at our next subject the Vance Theater. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the Vance Theater. I am from, when I'm in America, I was like in a very, very, very small rural farming town. Very small. Surrounded by seven or eight other very, very small rural towns. We actually had something that, when looking back on it, I, I don't think we should have had. And that was, we had this big, beautiful theater in the middle of a redneck small town, Florida. I don't really, looking back, I don't understand how that thing was there, considering the area, you know what I mean? But the Vance Theater, if you've ever seen the movie, if you've ever seen the movie Night of the Comet, that's exactly what the Vance Theater looked like. It had these big, beautiful double doors next to the ticket booth. Beautiful concession stand, video games. It looks just like the theater from Night of the Comet in this little, tiny, redneck town. Uh, the theater itself was huge, you know, in comparison. It had like 30 rows of seats, 30 rows of, what, uh, about 12? 30 rows of 12 seats, then a middle row of 30 with 20 seats, and then another row of 30 with 12 seats. So it was very big, big, beautiful screen. I like to sit in the middle of the middle. That's where I like to sit in a theater, is the middle, middle of the middle. Now, not only 
did the Vance Theater, big, beautiful, looked just like the one from Night of the Comet, even set up the same way with the aisles and stuff. It was fantastic. But the Vance Theater had another door on the other side of the ticket booth that led up to a fucking balcony. So in the middle of this podunk, nutbush Tennessee-like town in Florida, not only did we have this big, beautiful, majestic theater called the Vance Theater, but it had a fucking balcony that could fit 80, 100 people up there. So this was a big place in the middle of nowhere in this little bitty town, so it was wonderful. Now we get to the crowd. I do not think that you could have the kind of movie experience that we had with movies at the Vance Theater. Everybody knew everybody. Huge amount of people from all of these small towns would congregate. Um, it was very, very boisterous, very loud, but not in the bad way. People would stand in the aisles, they would scream at the screen, they would give comments, but none of it was ever irritating because they weren't talking about anything other than the film. They were reacting to the film. It was like a fucking rock concert. It was, it was very interesting. Um, and I don't think that, and I feel sorry for people younger than me who probably, I don't think you can have that kind of theater experience anymore. As a matter of fact, I remember a story here recently where some middle-aged 60-something-year-old guy like shot a dude in the theater for talking too much. It's just amazing. So, we're going to move on to the movie, and then I'm going to narrate what was happening in the theater at the time of this movie. And again, this is my number one most beloved, most nostalgic, most fantastic theater experience in my entire life. I've never seen an experience that, that beats this, and that was The Seduction with Morgan Fairchild. Now, The Seduction was released in 1982. It was during that year and a half after I saw the Friday the 13th thing and was at the theater every, month, every weekend. So I got to see a lot of movies. And with that crowd, they're all memorable. But this is The Seduction from 1982. It was directed and written by David Schmoller. And it stars Morgan Fairchild, Michael Sarazen, and Andrew Stevens. And Colleen Camp is also in it. Wonderful. So, here I am at the theater, seeing this thing called The Seduction. Now, I knew who Morgan Fairchild was. My grandmother was a big fan of nighttime soap operas, and so was I. Probably because of that. Um, you know, Dallas and Dynasty and Falcon Crest and all that shit was like the top of the charts. Morgan Fairchild was the star of Flamingo Road which was, you know, a super popular nighttime soap along with Dallas and Knott's Landing and all of that. So I knew who she was, and we began the movie, you know, and that theater was fucking packed. You understand me? It was packed. I told you how, you know, there was probably 200 plus people there. You know what I mean? Two to, yeah, 250. There was a lot of people there. <laughs> and um, so it was packed. And we open the movie with um, Jamie Douglas, who is the anchor of the local KXLA Channel 6 um, newscast. So she's a news anchor. And um, we get to see her in her beautiful house, um, see where she lives. And we see someone living above her in another beautiful house right up there who is like spying on her through a telescopic camera. Spying on her swimming, skinny dipping, naked. Well, there's no other way to skinny dip, is there? But we see Michael Sarazen, her boyfriend, Brandon, is there with her. And um, yeah, we're, we're like, okay, this is a little creepy. Crowd's very interested in the theater. We're, you know, getting into it. So... 
you know, we see them talking. Um, we then hear her get a phone call, and it's someone, you know, like going, hi, you don't know me, but, you know, I just want to tell you how much I like you and shit. So she gets a phone call, and then we see that it's from this guy who is spying on her, stalking her. He then turns around and we see his shrine. He's got like hundreds of pictures of her in this big shrine on his wall. And it's like, okay, this dude's fucked up. Some shit's going to go down. <laughs> so we then see her at work. We are introduced to her assistant, who is played by Kevin Brophy. If you don't know who that is, he was the star of with Linda Blair in Hell Night. So he is her assistant at, you know, at the studio. Um, he then brings her a big bouquet of flowers and is like, it's from, you know, and she's like, oh, is that from Brandon? And he's like, no, it's from Derek. You know, she's like, I don't know, no Derek. You know, so now we know who the stalker's name is. So it turns out, you know, that we then get to see a little bit about his life. He is a photographer who runs a ph photography studio. And um, we see what's going on in town, which is going to make her even more nervous, right? Is that there is a serial killer at work, uh, known as the Sweetheart Killer, and these series of murders are called the Sweetheart Murders. So we see her reporting about that, the Sweetheart Murders. We also get introduced to his assistant, Derek's assistant, whose name is Julie, who is a very important character in this movie as well. She has obviously got a crush on him. We then see her getting a phone call from Derek at the studio, wanting to talk to her and ask her out, you know, to go have dinner. She's like, no, thank you. I don't know you. I'm hanging up now. Okay, thanks. You know, no. So... She rejects him. She then um, ends up going to her friend, and that's where we are introduced to Robert. I mean, to Robin. Robin is played by Colleen Camp. These are the two movies I remember her most from. Um, I know she was in Apocalypse Now for like five minutes, but um, I remember her most as in from Valley Girl and The Seduction. She played the the Valley Girl's mom in The Seduction, the hippie mom, but. Um, so she gets home, and there she's got a bunch of voicemails from, from Derek. Um, she re And then he calls her, and she rejects him harder, you know, again, and goes to see Robin's. And then Robin's phone rings. And she doesn't know what's going on, so she's like, oh, it's for you. Who is it? You know, and, and he said, oh, I don't know, his name is Derek. And she's like, oh, hang up. That's the dude that I'm talking about. How did he get her number? You know what I'm saying? So we can tell that this guy is in deep. And you 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 then start feeling stressed because it's like one day you had no idea, nothing, you know, something was going on. And then the next day you've got this guy calling at you at your friend's house. But, you know, it's just like really sudden and he knows so much and you had no idea. So... You know, he calls her at Robin. Um, her boyfriend is back home, so she goes back home. She tells Brandon about the issue. Um, Derek, we see Derek obsessing over his photo shrine of her naked, you know, doing what you could imagine he was doing. Um, he then ends up showing up in her dressing room at the studio. And you're like, how the fuck did you get in here? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> And, um, but, but he claims to be apologizing. I'm not going to bother you anymore. Okay. So, and that's where she makes her biggest mistake was when he hands her that box of candy and, you know, he's like, well, I'm not going to bother you anymore. And he starts walking out. She stops him. You should never do that. She stops him and shows a moment of kindness and forgiveness, you know, by going, thanks for the candy. That's all a psycho needs. You know what I'm saying? You might as well have just had a weekend in Malibu with the motherfucker just from those couple of worlds. That's how those psychos are. So, 
He apologizes with the candy and not going to bother her anymore. She tells Brandon, and, you know, Brandon says something pretty prophetic, and that is like, well, if he wasn't going to bother you anymore, he wouldn't have come and done this. So she takes off and goes back home, and this is where it gets ugly because Derek actually rings her doorbell, and he had slashed Brandon's tire at the studio so he could get there before Brandon. Brandon was going to be busy, obviously, changing a tire. He busts in on her, taking photographs, like right up in her face. And it scares the hell out of her. And in the theater around me, everybody was like, because you also have to remember, this was the first stalking movie. Celebrity stalking, you know, people stalking in general. This was one of the first ones ever made about this kind of behavior in a ma in the mainstream film community. You know, you had this attack on Teresa Saldana, you know, that girl from, from that was in that show with Pam Dauber, you know, that got shot. Um, Jodie Foster, you know, all of this stuff was going on. And this is like one of the first movies that really addressed this issue. And also from the special features, this movie is based on a real news anchor from the L.A. area that this really happened to. Kind of. Not the whole story, but it's based on it. So they end up after that incident, because Brandon does make it there and beats the absolute shit out of Darren. Darren? This isn't Bewitched. Derek. And then ends up, you know, they, they end up going to the, the cops. Well, even more so today, cops are fucking useless. They can't do anything. No, we can't do anything. I'm sorry, I can't do anything. So, they really can't do anything about it. Um, Derek ends up showing up at Robin's photo shoot. She works in commercials and is a model. Um, at first, she doesn't know who it is. And then when she finds out who it is, you know, he's there to beg her to help him. You know, if you could just get her to go to dinner with me, she'll see that I'm not a freak. Now, you've already got comments all over the theater. You know, people at the screen. You know, it's like, uh-uh, girl, <laughs> don't do that, man. Don't do it, you know. So the crowd's already getting lively, especially after that photo attack with the camera. So she's kind of upset. Robin tells her about him coming to her place of work at the photo shoot. It's like he's following all of us. So they end up like going to Neiman Marcus. They end up going shopping. While she's there, she looks at this really pretty little music box, but then decides not to get it. Later on, though, she hears the music, and she thinks she hears Derek's voice. And she can't really be sure, but then when she goes and makes phone calls, here's a bunch of fucking, you know, checks her messages. Here's a bunch of fucking phone calls from this asshole again. Comes out of the phone booth and boom, right in his face, there he is trying to give her that music box that she had looked at. So she really freaks out, you know, and is like, I can't stand you, and you don't seem to be able to get that through your head, you know. So she like pushes him, it breaks the music box, um, you know, and things are escalating. When she has that big scene and she breaks it, uh, Brandon then goes and talks to an actual psychiatrist about, you know, how dangerous this guy could be. And she is like, it's 50-50, man. You know, he could be just a harmless bother, but there's a good 50% chance that he is actually psychotic and will kill her. You know, so you're kind of in a bad situation. You know, don't cross him, which they've already done that. They've already crossed him. You know what I mean? So, we then get one of the most creepy scenes. And that is where she, you know, while this is all going on, and she's at work that day, we see Derek in her bathroom. He's in her bathroom taking a bath and shit. She comes in, and he hides in the closet. And that is some, like, really tension. I mean, the theater 
crowd that I was in was like hooting and hollering, you know. And you might think they would be hooting and hollering and her taking a bath. No, they were just all freaked out, you know. And so people were yelling at the screen, you know. It, it, it's just like, he's in the fucking closet. Don't take your clothes off, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. And it is extremely creepy as he watches her, you know, get naked and take a bath. And he's in the closet, like, playing with himself. It's, it's just, it's just like moans and groans were coming from the crowd, you know, because everybody was like really getting into this story. Now, she gets a phone call and she gets out of the tub and goes out and then he says her name. Man, like people were like just screaming in the theater, you know, they were, they were just like, oh God, <laughs> he's going to kill you. Um, but she screams, he runs, he gets away, Brandon shows up, he's gone, and um, he makes it back up there to his house. I mean, like, nobody knows that this dude only lives, like, about a 100 yards from you, like, right over there, right? So that makes it even more creepy. So Brandon talks to the cops again. Can't really do anything for you. I suggest you get a gun. Um, you know, that's about the only thing that he can do. So, Jamie knows that she's being watched when um, that music box was sitting there on her bathroom. You know, that was a little scene. Like, she sees that music box with this ripped up picture of her in it. And that's when he had said, Jamie, you know, and she had screamed and he had ran out. So, um we see Julie speaking to him at how she's starting to suspect him of something, his assistant, because she's basically in love with him. And he keeps talking about, you know, this girl that he's dating, that he's in a relationship and stuff like that. He at that point tells her that he's engaged to someone else. And that's why he can't date her. Now, Brandon ends up getting jamie a shotgun you know click click shotgun and she don't want it but he's like you know you need to have it around because they're you know she's like well i'm not going to become a barbarian like him and stuff like that and he's like well you know being nice ain't got nothing to do when you're dealing with crazy you know what i'm saying so she's back at work and we see her like editing some raw footage and she notices Derek in the background and that scares the hell out of her again you know because it was out she was out there doing a report at one of the newest bodies that had been found from this sweetheart murder and there was him so Kevin Brophy's character you know he did say something a little bad and that is like well maybe he was the, maybe he's the sweetheart killer you know, and then he realizes how wrong that was in her situation <laughs> to put that on her. And he apologizes for that. But, you know, he, she calms down and she manages to go on the air for that night's report. Unbeknownst to all of them, though, that asshole has snuck right back into the studio and has sat down and wrote teleprompter script and managed to get it as a last minute entry you know he sneaks in there he hands it to them last minute edition they don't really pay no attention to it they stick it on the teleprompter so while she's telling the news reading off the teleprompter it comes down and there it is it comes up you know she's just in the middle of a sentence you know and we'll be back to talk about that plane crack jamie i'm watching you and the she realizes and she reads it and she has a mental breakdown right there on live TV because he's watching me. He's everywhere. He's going to kill me and nobody will help me. You know what I'm saying? So she ends up going back home. She's really upset now. Brandon's staying with her. He tries, you know, to get her to calm down. Um, and they end up taking a hot tub bath. You know, they, they go out and sit in the hot tub and he makes some cheese and crackers you know, and trying to calm her down. Um, the cops call, though, 
and tell Brandon that they have discovered this guy's name and his location and that he's going to pay him a visit. So he goes and tells Jamie that, look, they found him. They know his name. They know his location. They're going to go take care of this. You know, they're going to give him a little talking to. So it's all over. Calm down. Everything will be fine. So they start making out. You know, they start making out in the hot tub. And then they start having sex. And, you know, right in the middle of them having sex in this hot tub, Brandon makes the orgasm noise, but it's not because he just had an orgasm. It's because he's got that big, giant cheese knife that he had just used making them food in there, half deep in his back, and he is laying there floating naked dead. So her boyfriend is killed on top of her in the middle of sex by this psycho whom she just goes into shock as Derek, like, takes the body out, pulls it up the hill. She goes inside, tries to call 911, you know, tries to call the cops, and it's busy, and it stays busy. And I'm like, you know, that's got to be a shitty situation, right? You're in the middle of trouble, and 911 is busy, and stays busy. All of our lines are tied up. Oh, well. So she then, like, gets the detective's card and tries to call the detective. No go there either. Ring, 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 ring. Nobody answers. That's because, actually, he's up there at Derek's house. So her boyfriend has just been killed in that horrible situation. She can't get the cops. She can't get the detective. What does she do? You know. So the detective does... I mean, you know, so she decides, well, that's it. So she actually, because, you know, the cop had given Brandon, and Brandon had wrote down Derek's phone number, she actually calls Derek, you know. She actually calls Derek and is like, so what's up? You know, where are you at? I need you. You know, so... The crowd in the theater that I was in was just like going fucking nuts. You know, I was like, she's going to fucking kill that motherfucker. Yeah. (laughs) You know, so everybody's like screaming. And the energy in that theater was just amazing because this is the end of the third act. It's all the shit's hitting the fan. (laughs) So she gets the guy to come down and he gets all dressed up, you know, because she's like, I need you and stuff like that. So she gets put, like, the bed's, like, made up to make it look like she's laying there in the bed. And he comes in, and he goes over there, and he's like, Jamie, I'm here. I'm here for you, baby. And he pulls back the sheet, and it's pillows, and then you hear click, click. And he turns around, and she's got that shotgun aimed at him, and she fires off, you know. Man, that fucking theater. It was like. Guns N' Roses just stepped out on stage in 1988. You know what I mean? (laughs) I mean, 75% of the people in that theater were on their feet when she started, when she, when he turned around and she blasted that shotgun. People were just, you know, doing that and they were screaming and they would kill that motherfucker and all this kind of shit. It was, it was amazing. That whole crowd The whole theater was just in an uproar. So she takes like three or four shots at him. And she said in the special features that kind of pissed her off because she's like, I'm from Texas and y'all keep having me miss him. What's up? (laughs) So I agree with that. But she, you know, but then again, he was spry. He did move pretty fast (laughs) and dived out a window and dived into the pool. So he manages to get away. And... He goes back up there to his house and starts taking his wet clothes off. And there's a knock at the door and it's that Julie person. So his assistant, Julie, is like, I need to talk to you. I know all about you and Jamie Douglas. I know what you've been doing because the cop came by looking for you at the studio. Please let me help you. And, you know, and he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. You're a fucking freak. Get away from me. I don't like you. You know, and while he's talking to her, the cop actually shows up. 
and is like, look, dude, calm down. Stop all this shit. Neither of them know, and he's just murdered the bitch, and J- J- Jamie Douglas is right down there below him. So he tells him to chill out or he's going to wish he had. He leaves, and then Julia's like, something's wrong with you. She don't love you. You've got to stop this. That freaks him out. He screams, rips the, the chain off the door, throws her ass out. She walks on down there to her car, but she doesn't leave because she's so upset. Now, Jamie, she calls him back on the phone and starts taunting him like, where'd you go, man? <laughs> you know, and all the crowd was like laughing and carrying on. He's like, where are you? You know, where are you at, baby? This is all part of the this is all part of the courtship. Isn't this what you wanted? You know, I'm all yours now and you're all mine. So come on back, you know, I mean, what's up? So, that's like pissed him off. Then we see Julie seeing, well, he goes and he like rips up his shrine, because now he hates her, right? Now he's going to go like in for the kill. So, what he doesn't realize, though, is that Julie had stayed out there in the parking lot, right? So she sees him come outside and go down the back. She starts, you know, she follows him. He gets down there to Jamie's, and then Jamie realizes her shotgun is gone from the chair. Man, this 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 explosive, gigantic, because you know, he, like, grabs her, turns around. Everybody in the theater is, like, screaming and carrying on. And he's, like, you know, puts the gun right up under her chin. It's like, you know, is this what you were looking for? You know, and, and it starts, like, you know, he's going to, like, rape her and stuff throws her on the bed, stuff like that. And then she, like, reverse psychologies him, turns it right back around on him. You know, it's like, no, 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 okay, yeah, yeah, this is the time, do it, do it, fuck me, fuck me, you know, shit like that. Crowd is exploding in this theater. (laughs) She finally gets him down, gets the knife, and has got it up against his throat, and it's like, you know, come on, fuck me. This is it, baby, fuck me. That's when we find out he's fucking impotent. He can't even get it up. He's like, I can't. You know, and so she's like, you're not a man and stuff like that. Crowd is howling, 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 you know. And she starts walking away. You know, she like takes the knife from his throat and starts walking away. I can't tell you what the crowd was doing at that moment because everybody was screaming, you know, no, don't do that. Cut his fucking throat. Don't walk away. What are you doing? You know, and um, sure enough, she gets a few feet from him, and then he grabs her by the ankles, and here it goes again. Only this time, he gets the upper hand, and he straddles her, and he's on top of her, and he's going to, with this big, gigantic knife. I didn't know a cheese knife was that fucking big. Bigger than a butcher knife, you know what I mean? And he's going to kill her. And then all of a sudden, Julie, she comes running in, screaming at him. And she's got that shotgun in her hand, you know. And he just, like, looks at her and then looks back down at at Jamie and Julie, you know. He looks at Julie and he looks back down at Jamie. And he's just like, fuck it. And he starts to come down with the knife. And she shotguns him to the gut, knocks him eight feet over there to the bed. And that was an ugly looking bang, too, because he was like all busted up. And then he dies. And Julia's screaming. And Jamie is just sort of like, (laughs) and that is a 10 out of 10 for various reasons. So that was the seduction. And like I said, It is my number one movie experience of my life because, let me tell you, I feel very, very sad for people in this day and age who can't have a theater experience like we had. I imagine everybody would be telling you to keep quiet and, and, you know, you know, and stuff like that. But you have to understand that the noise that's being made, that was made, uh, you know, of our local crowd... Um, the noise that's being made was not unrelated noise, and I think that's the reason why it wasn't bothersome. I mean, if you're at a rock concert 
and you're watching Guns N' Roses or Judas Priest and some dude next to you is blasting Kanye West or some dopey shit like that, you might get upset with them. But if they're screaming for Guns N' Roses like you are screaming for them, you see what I'm saying? So I never saw anybody bothered by how rambunctious all the crowds was at the Vance Theater for movies. And I think it's because I never really heard anybody making any noise that was not related to the movie. You know, it's sort of like all the noise you hear at the Rocky Horror Picture Show is related to the movie. And so, um, seeing all those people jumping up out of their seats, seeing them screaming at the scene, hearing the funny things that people would say in in certain moments. And when it was quiet and dramatic, everybody was quiet and dramatic. You know, everybody was quiet. And when it was exciting, everybody was exciting. Like I said, she pulled that fucking shotgun out, that place went up in flames, <laughs> you know, because everybody was just hooting and hollering and, and getting into it. And, um, yeah. So... That's why I would spend 30 bucks to get this into my collection finally. Um, I did have the file downloaded so I could watch it whenever I wanted to, but it's just not. I'm a movie collector, you know, having it of my very own, the, the Scream Factory Blu-ray. And the, the special features on this are wonderful. There is a very, very long interview with um, Morgan Fairchild done in 2019, so recent when this was released and uh, she is still good god she looks like she is only five years older than she was in this movie it's amazing but um the stuff that she said about the movie was absolutely amazing it was really cool to hear all of the stuff that went into making this movie and um there's lots of other special features, including a long interview with Andrew Stevens, which I really didn't like it, to tell you the truth. He was an asshole. Same to me. Some of the stuff that he said was just like, he's like really stuck on himself for no good reason. I mean, he was cute in this movie, but come on, you know. So, yeah. That is The Seduction from 1982. It is my number one favorite theater experience of my entire life. I told you all the reasons why. Going to the theater in my town was amazing. And there's a lot of, you know, it's like um, my second favorite theater experience would probably be The Lost Boys. So you can imagine what we were all doing during The Lost Boys, right? I mean, 200 people dancing in the aisles to all of those movies and stuff. It was a fucking party. <laughs> you know, we had Corey Haim and we had Kiefer Sutherland and we had that music, you know. So, uh, yeah, that was probably my second favorite. But The Seduction is my number one favorite movie experience. Um, the screaming, the the relevant noise made during this movie made it all so exciting it is a huge huge nostalgia bomb for me and um i just watched it a couple of days ago or yesterday when i wrote the script and um yeah so that is the seduction and why i love it so much always remember never forget you are a very very special person DNA proves it. Don't let anyone ever tell you different, and I will see you in the next thing I do. Love you. Miss you. Bye-bye. Comment if you like this movie. Comment uh, your favorite movie experience. Was it anything like mine? Is there anywhere in this country where you can have a, a, a theater experience like that? Or is everybody going to tell you to shut the fuck up? I'm so glad that nobody said shut the fuck up. First of all, you couldn't guide anybody in that theory to shut the fuck up. That'd probably beat your ass. It's redneck Florida, after all. We're going to yell at the screen. Relevantly. I'll see you in the next. Bye-bye.